Hey guys, you guys see me? Comment if the uh, the volume's good. Let me uh, turn up the mic. Are you guys able to hear me well? Anybody? <laughs> Can you guys hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay, guys. Yeah, I just have to make sure before we go, obviously. Um, how's it going, Jason? So um, today our format is going to be a number of things. Um, I always like to have kind of like a central topic. I don't like to just make it answering questions because I think it kind of gets repetitive and a little bit boring. So... We're going to have a topic um, that I'm going to talk about, um, and then uh, I'm going to kind of get into the answering the questions for uh, the elite membership. And if there's an interesting uh, question from somebody that's not in my course, no problem. Um, I'll answer it if it's like the, no offense, if it's the usual kind of repetitive, my dog's bad, how do I make him good? I, you know, I, th I think there's better forms for that. Um now, let me see here. I'm just going to quickly go up while we're waiting for people to roll in and uh, go through some of the comments. So Dylan Ryan, I've been working with my GSD on off leash and he does great in a heel and mostly staying close, but having issues with the break um, and him getting excited and running out of the heel. So what you mean is he's with you and he's leaving a lot, right? Um, I think that for, for, for dogs like this, young dogs, you have to understand they have a lower... Um, uh, they have a lower attention span. Okay. So the solution for these dogs actually, so there's two solutions. Number one, I find that dogs that leave regularly, there isn't enough of a consequence um, for those dogs leaving. And that's why they do it a lot, right? Like they're, they're kind of being allowed to get away with leaving a lot. So what you might want to do if your dog really understands the behavior is up the level of your correction okay um and by that i mean uh you know whatever level you're working with on the e-collar you want to make it a little bit more significant maybe a time or two teach them a bit of a lesson and make them a little bit cautious about leaving the position but here's the other solution to that right and sorry guys if you can hear my my little guy in the background in case you're wondering why i haven't been so prolific on youtube lately um we had a son born about a month ago so he's uh New, new baby, a little bit less sleep, a little more stuff going on here. So um, if you hear him in the background, don't shoot, don't shoot me. I'm sorry. Um, so anyways, yes, um, for the dog that leaves the position a lot, what you want to do is you want to up the level of consequence for him leaving. And then what you also want to do um, is uh, have him break on purpose. So if I'll say, I'll be like, oh, you want to break? No problem. Break. And then I'll tell him heal again, break, heal, break, heal. And I'll make him do it like 30 times. Okay. Until he's like, you know, I don't think I want to leave anymore. <laughs> right. So sometimes the best way to deal with a problem is to embrace it. Right. So for me, for instance, I always say like dogs that like to run out the door, right? Like, oh, I opened the door and he runs out. I say, okay, no problem. I open the door. Go on, run on out, run out. Dog runs out, comes back. I make him come back. He runs out. I make him come back. I intentionally open the door. I say, go ahead, buddy. Get out. And he runs out. And I'll use, of course, I'm using the electric or I'm using a line. And I make him come back. And I embrace whatever the problem is. And I say, we'll do it 100 times until you understand that that's not the solution. Right? That's not, that's not where you're going to find your highest level of reward. I'm just going to make you do it 100 times until leaving the house or leaving the heel is just more work in the end. Right? If you understand what I'm saying. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Well, you're going to be hearing him, so we'll see if you're still congratulating me by the end of this. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, it's, listen, I'm in a country property here, so the internet's not good unless I'm, like, on the main floor, and it's still kind of decent. Um, but if I go upstairs to get away from, you know, the baby noise, you guys aren't going to hear me. So, unfortunately, this is where we're at. 
Okay, now let me go through some of this stuff here, some of these questions. Frustrated with the breeders advertising melon law right now. Canada and the U.S. 3,500 and up. No health info, no lineage. Taking advantage of breed popularity. One ad selling rare black melon law for 12K. Listen, guys, like there's nothing new about this. There's nothing new about this. And I think a lot of us as people that own and love dogs learn the hard way right? Buying dogs from breeders that really have no business breeding. It sounds, listen, when you don't know, you don't know, right? A dog is a dog. A German shepherd is a German shepherd. A Malinois is a Malinois. You don't know that there's a fundamental difference, right? You don't know how important bloodline and health testing and individuals and character testing and all that are, right? You really don't understand. And it takes a little bit before you learn. So, you know, um, of course, when you see ads like that, I always kind of see, I look at it kind of like scams. I'm like, it sucks that people are out there scamming, but at the end of the day, it's up to you to do your due diligence. And some people wake up to that and some people don't. And that kind of ties into um, a little bit of what I'm going to talk about right now. So guys, please don't blast me with questions right now, just because I want to, I want to kind of cover today's topic and then we're going to go into, um, uh, the questions and answers. So if you nail me with questions right now, um, it's all just going to add up and I'm not going to get to half of them versus if you wait until I say, all right, start hitting me with the questions. I think it'll be a little bit more, um, you know, reasonable. Now, if you want to say something to add to the topic, no problem. Go ahead, say something and add it to the topic. Um, so anyways, you want to breed dogs. Now, I said, let me talk about this because it's been coming up a lot more um, recently, right? With people saying, hey, has like, uh, I want to buy a dog from you because I want to breed that dog, so on and so forth. And I always say, okay, right? Number one, I always am like, okay, well, what are you going to breed it with? <laughs> okay, because there's a fun, there's a saying that I really go back to, okay? Um, I think it was Helmer, Helmet Razor that said it. Helmet Razor is a very famous German guy, big in the German Shepherd breed and so on and so forth. He's like, I think, 80 years old. Knows his stuff forwards, backwards. He's Dr. Helmet Razor, if I remember correctly. He said, people that breed but do not train is like someone that doesn't see color being an artist. Now, I don't know too many artists that would be very good if they were, they didn't see colors, right? The idea is that if you really want to breed, and we're talking specific, I'm not talking about chihuahuas or, you know, golden doodles or whatever. I'm talking about working breeds, right? Breeds that are designed for something like the Belgian Malinois, like the German Shepherd. Those are not breeds for someone that doesn't know what they're doing to be, to be breeding. And I don't understand it, to be honest with you. It's like, listen, when I first got a dog, I didn't say right off the hop, I want this dog and I'm going to breed. I said, I want the dog and I want to do things with the dog. And then by doing things with the dog, I'll determine if it's a dog worth breeding. Okay. Not, I love her. Not, you know, oh, he's the best ever. And he's so cute. My neighbors think he's cute. So therefore I'm going to breed him to their, you know, their German shepherd or whatever. Like, are you actually able to fundamentally evaluate the character and the quality that the dog brings to the table? Not your emotional, um, not your emotional value that you've placed on the dog, but the actual value of the dog in terms of a breeding candidate, right? Are you able to do that? If you're not training, right? And I'm not talking about you going to the local, you know, dog trainer and doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I'm saying you're actually training for something. You're trying to achieve something. You're pursuing something. And you've been doing that for a little bit. You're, I would argue that you really don't know what the heck it is that you're doing. And you really have no business breeding a working dog. Now, listen, you want to breed Frenchies or whatever? Have at it. I mean, be ethical, obviously. Don't breed individuals that have bad character. Don't, don't breed individuals with poor health, so on and so forth. Um, but, you know we're talking about working dogs and working dogs is a whole different kettle of fish. And I see, like you said there, you know, the Malawas being sold on, on Kijiji and, 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 and so on and so forth. There's a lot of really poorly bred dogs. I I've had people bring the dogs here and I feel bad because they come here for my business, right? Hey, can you train this dog? Uh, I want to breed her. And I say, look, man, I'll help you with the dog, but this is not a dog for breeding this. I know she's a Belgian Malawa. 
there's literally there's a guy who brought me a Belgian Malinois recently, and dude, if you're watching this again, it's nothing against you. It's just that dog. Like he brought me this dog. This dog was terrified, terrified of everything. Like just a terrible example of the breed. It would be completely useless in any kind of real working capacity. If you bred that dog with such poor nerves and with such a high level of sensitivity to a dog, even a strong dog, you're not going to produce good dogs. You're going to produce dangerous dogs. You're going to produce dogs that, you know, uh, have those insecurities that comes from the mother, that have that lack of nerve, but also will have the aggression from the father's side. What happens when you combine nerves and aggression and intensity and drive? It's not a good combination. You lose the stability of the dogs. People get hurt. Dogs get hos you know, people get hospitalized. You know, dogs get put down. It's not a good scenario for anybody. So I'm always saying, if you're not training, you should have no rush to breed. And realistically, look, I know the market was crazy. The market was crazy a year ago. Um, when COVID first kind of the lockdowns first hit, the market went absolutely buck wild. People were selling mutts on, on Craigslist and Kijiji for, you know, $5,000. Okay. Like mutts of no particular breeding. And that was just the market. I think literally people were locked inside and they said, you know, I got nothing better to do than might as well have a dog. I've been thinking about having one for a while. And that was for about a, about seven, eight, eh, maybe eight, eight to 10 months. It was like that, but it's not like that anymore. The market's cooled, right? And um, if you're just jumping into breeding to breed, you're just going to be producing dogs of no particular value. You really need to be able to evaluate a dog. And I'm going to say this, right? It's, a, it's an interesting thing. Where do I get good breeding stock? People ask, right? Where do you get your dogs for breeding? And I've gotten dogs from all over. I bought dogs from the United States. I bought dogs from Canada. Um, I've bought dogs from Europe, right? And a lot of dogs from Europe, tons of dogs from Europe. Probably the most dogs I ever bought is from Europe, right? Um, most of my dogs came from there because there's just such a big supply of them there. And people assume all oh, those European dogs, they are the best. And listen, they'll cost you a pretty penny, especially if you want a half decent one from there. It'll cost you a pretty penny, let me tell you, okay? But the locality, where the dog is from, it's no guarantee of how good it is. What's in the dog's pedigree? Again, no guarantee of how good it is. And people really struggle with this. I watch people, you know, because listen, I've been breeding, you know, German Shepherds not all that long, maybe a few years now, right? I already have dogs that I'm training from my program. I watch breeders. They're breeding dogs how long? They're still not training one of their own dogs, in whatever competitions they're competing in. Why not? Are you not producing something that's good enough, right, for you to compete in? Or are you just a puppy factory producing puppies simply to sell off as pets because they can't really do anything else? Is that what you really want to be in a working breed? I want 10 years from now people to know about my lines. I want people to come to me for my lines because they believe in what I believe in and I'm producing a consistent kind of dog that people know are going to be good, whether it's for sport, for police work, um, you know, for fit, for protection, whatever it is, right? And I already have people contacting me because they see what I say and what I talk about when it comes to the breeding of dogs and they buy into what I'm selling. Now, there's a lot of people that hear what I say and they say, I don't want any part of that. That is not for me. No problem. But I'm not standing for everything. There's a saying goes, you stand for everything um, you know, if you support everything, you'll end up standing for nothing, right? And the same goes for breeding. You need to have a vision. What is it I'm after? I'm not after a German Shepherd, right? German Shepherds is just the general category. I'm after a specific type of German Shepherd. And I'm after consistent production of that type of dog. A dog with good nerves. A dog with edge. A dog with extreme drives. A dog with c commitment and stability, Right? I'm after that. I'm after a dog that can be a police service dog. I'm after pet um, uh, protection dogs. I'm after a dog that can live with somebody in the house. And I'm after a dog that, that can go and serve on a police force. Now, not all dogs are going to be all those things, but I'm after a litter production, like a production. So let's say I have a litter of six where I'm going to have members of all those categories within the litter. That's what I'm after, right? 
And sometimes it's, listen, I've already had, obviously, I'm on the end litter right now, right? I really like the end litter, by the way. A lot of consistency in that litter. My last registered German Shepherd breeding of Onyx, very good consistency in that litter. I really liked, like, just about every pup in that litter. And some of you may be watching this have one of those puppies already. Um, but anyways, regardless, um, you know, I'm after something specific. And unfortunately, I, I see a lot of breeders, they are not after anything specific. They're just breeding willy-nilly. Well, um, uh, Axel is from Germany and 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 uh, Berka is from, you know, uh, Czech. And I'm going to have Czech German Shepherds and all this nonsense, right? Oh, I'm breeding DDR. You know how, you know what I think about DDR. I'm not even going to get into DDR right now. But people are breeding off hype. Oh, this is a daughter uh, or this is a son of the whatever world champion, right? Yeah, but who's the female? I'll tell you what, guys. I just bought a puppy. I bought a puppy for, for the most money I've ever paid for a puppy, right? Most money I ever paid for a puppy. I bought her from a breeder that's been breeding German Shepherds. I think this is their first litter of German Shepherds, right? And they're friends of mine. Like I go and train with them regularly. I bought this puppy from them, not because of the father. The father is very famous, Bordy Blendy, by the way. For those of you who know Bordy Blendy, very famous dog. I didn't buy for Bordy Blendy because I've seen puppies from Bordy Blendy that I did not like. And I thought, ah, I don't think he's going to very produce very well with a lot of girls, right? A lot of – some males are really able to, to throw themselves in every female, and, and they're making something even with females that aren't so good. Bordy Blendy doesn't strike me as one of those dogs. But then I saw the female. They had bought a female from a very well-known uh, uh, German competitor. And he's not known for having dogs that are soft, dogs that are easy, dogs that um, are lower drive. He's known for very intense, extreme dogs, Okay. They bought a female from him, paid quite a bit of money for it. I said, let me see the female, because they were telling me they did this boardy breeding, whatever, whatever. I said, let me see the female. They brought the female out. I said, I want a puppy. I didn't even think about boardy. I said, you know what? For this bitch that you've got here, boardy is the perfect candidate. Not because I think he'll make them. I think he'll actually calm her down a little bit in a good way. Not in like water her down, but calm her down, make a little more stability, right? She looked to me just in her experience. I didn't even look at her pedigree. I just said, let me see her. Take her out. Let me see her with the, the ball and whatever. Let me just see her, how she walks around people she doesn't know. And I really liked her. She reminded me a lot of Charlie Von Ipso, um, the bitch that I had that produced Gage for me. Um, but better, in my opinion. Better than her. Anyways, Rob and Michelle, if you're watching this, fantastic puppy so far. I actually just messaged, uh, I just messaged uh, the breeder. I was like... I rarely say this, but this puppy is off the wall. Like favorite, by far, I think of all the puppies I've had lately in the last few years, my favorite puppy, really extreme traits, showing such a, such a, such a strong confidence, big female, just like her dad. Um, and, and shows that same kind of frustration and that drive that her mother has. I think it's going to be an excellent female. I mean, I could be wrong, could be health issues. You never know, but based on what I'm seeing right now. So why did I, my point is, I bought from a breeder who literally had one litter. And I will not buy from some breeders that have been breeding for 30 years, right? Why? Why? Because they invested, they spent the money on a female that most, most she probably cost about as much as most breeders spend on like three or four females, okay? They spent the money on that female, but it's not the money that they spent. It's the quality of the bitch. Right. And then they bred her to one of the best males in the world. It's pretty um, undebatable. But the quality of the bitch, they spent money on the bitch. They, they, they didn't just jump into breeding to breed. They spent money on the bitch. Now they breed Malwas as well. Um, and that's, that's, you know, they've been, I think there are a few litters into the Malwas. But my point is that I have not, I don't even think I've bought a puppy from a, a, a Canadian breeder ever. No, I don't think I've bought a puppy from a Canadian breeder ever for myself. I saw this breeding. I said, I don't even have time to train another dog. And I said, I have to have a female from this litter because I saw the quality in the bitch, right? I'm trying to get something across to you guys. So I, one more thing before we jump, jump on, move on to the questions. I know some of you are getting bored, okay? I have a client and she might be watching this too, right? She brought a few dogs to me for training, you know? So... I know, I know her enough and I feel responsible enough to her to say things, 
even if they're uncomfortable things to say. She wants to breed dogs. She doesn't know very much about working dogs. She hasn't been in the into working dogs long enough. She hasn't done anything in the working dog. And she wants to breed dogs. She's always buying these dogs for breeding. And I see her with dog after dog after dog. And none of them are good, right? And I said to her yesterday, I said, listen, and I say good in terms of good for the breeding, right? I, I, listen, a dog is a dog. Even if it's a dog that has terrible qualities, like in terms of breeding quality, it's a dog, you know, we have a moral responsibility to treat it you know, as such, but, um, and, and give it, you know, that ethical treatment that it deserves. But when we have to be heartless, and I told her this, as a breeder, you have to be ruthless and heartless in terms of your selection. The dog doesn't have what it takes, immediately remove the dog from your program and give it to somebody who can give it a pet home. I've told, I've bought dogs. I spent good money on dogs from Europe. They come here, they land. I take that dog through a warehouse and I do some bike work with that dog. And I say, this dog will never breed in my facility. I, I'm not going to put my name on this, right? And there's been dogs maybe in the past where they're kind of on the line. And I say, let me have one litter and see. And almost every time with those dogs, you know, it's only been one or two, I think. Um, I've regretted the breeding at all, right? And those those dogs were kind of on the line. For most people, they would be happy with those dogs. For me, I mm -mm 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 -mm, right? I saw the problems. I saw the problems that... People, oh, it's it's training. Oh, she never got out, you know, wasn't exposed, blah, blah, blah. 99% of behavioral um, and drive expression that you see in a dog is genetic, right? And it's going to pass to the puppies. You must be very careful. And I've had enough experience with that and seeing what the females give the puppies that I don't mess around with females that are substandard anymore. I just don't. It's not worth it. I need puppies for me. This is the difference between, you know, my breeding program, I'm not trying to sell all the puppies. I'm trying to keep about half of them, right? Because I need dogs. I'm, I'm tired of buying dogs from Europe, right? I need dogs for me. I need to raise dogs. And that's what we do here now is we're raising a lot of our puppies for ourselves that we can train them and sell them as trained dogs um, for protection and for police work, um, you know, and even just as family companions down the road. I need a supply of those dogs. So they're coming from our program. So if I'm not breeding good dogs, I'm screwing myself over. Right. It's not that I'm just selling the puppies and making some money on the puppies. And when the owners contact me with issues and even the, the ones I sell as puppies, guess what? Guess who they're coming back to for training? They're coming back to me. And this is what I mean. When you train, you have another level of understanding about what you should and should not be breeding. So people are in such a big hurry to run to the breeding. I don't know. Maybe it's for the money. Maybe they just have some strange urge to see their dog have puppies. I don't know what it is. But be very careful. And if you're going to do it, take some time. Make some success in the sport, right? And if you're doing working breeds, there's only certain sports. Dog diving doesn't count and neither does agility. Make some success in a sport that truly tests your dog's character. Take your dog through the training process and learn. Because if you take your dog through the training process, you put pressure on your dog. You see your dog in multiple environments. You see the drive, the actual functional drive your dog has for the food, for the ball, for whatever. Is this dog worth breeding? You see the problems your dog has. You see the challenges, the struggles. How does your dog handle things that stress them out? Do they fall apart? Do they shut down? Or do they bounce right back? Resilience is genetic. Don't forget that, right? So, so many people in a big rush to breed, they don't, in, they don't understand enough what they're looking at to breed properly. They might breed beautiful dogs, right? Big, dark, sable dogs. You see a lot of those, right? And I don't, if you, if you know me, I definitely don't, I have some beautiful dogs, but it has nothing to do with their appearance as to why I breed them. Right. So my, I guess my point is this, be very careful. Um, oh, jumping back to that client that I was talking about, I said, I saw her multiple times with dogs. And when you add up, like I was thinking, man, I've seen her now five, six dogs now, maybe four or five dogs. I don't know. Anyways. You see, I seen her with this many dogs, none of them good, right, for breeding. And I said, man, you know, had you just slowed down and spent all that money that you spent on all those substandard dogs on one or two real good dogs. If you just said, you know what, I'm going to spend my money on it. I'm going to go to someone that has proven success because that's the other thing, right? Buying dogs from all over this Canadian breeder that I said to her. I'm like, well, why didn't you buy from me? Or why, you know, oh, you're too expensive. And oh, I said, well, why didn't you call him, right? Like, why didn't you call? I asked her, why didn't you call him with me? I didn't even ask her why you didn't buy with me. Because I assume probably because I'm too expensive, right? And a lot of people feel that way. No problem. 
And the reason I'm expensive is because I don't need to sell them. Breeders that need to sell, of course, their prices are lower. I'm happy to keep them. Some some dogs, listen, you want, you want a certain type of dog from me unless I know you. Right. And I know that you're going to actually trial the dog and show the dog. And I'm I'm going to get the benefit of the breeder as the breeder from having my dog seen in competition with a worthy competitor, with someone that's going to bring out the best in them and treat them well. And then, of course, for you, there's a special price, a lower price. But if you're just some random person contacting, hey, I want a working dog. I say, no problem. I will give you a working dog because I don't spell people bullshit. Right. I will say, listen, with my puppies. I'll go through them. I'll say, okay, this one, I cannot say anything about it being able to work. But there's always a few in the litter where I say, these ones for sure, I will put money on it. Literally. Like I'll put my guarantee behind it that these are working quality dogs, right? They won't be for everybody. But if someone says, hey, I want a sport competition dog and I have pretty high aspirations in the sport, I say, no problem. This is the dog for you. And people that have taken dogs from me know because I'm honest about it. I, I have no emotional attachment to the dogs that I'm breeding or the litters that I'm having. Emotional in that I'm not kennel blind. I see it for what it is. It's either good or it's not. There's, there's strengths, there's weaknesses. What are we working with, right? So, you know, my point is there's many breeders like this lady that, that, that has been here for training a lot, right? Is, is that, you know, oh, you know, that guy's too expensive or, or so they're, they're always going everywhere. The grass is always greener, right? Oh, this Canadian breeder. Oh, that breeder in Czech Republic. You think the, the people in the Czech Republic are sending you their best dogs? No, they're not. Not unless they know you personally. They're not sending you their best dogs. I'll give you an example. So I bought a puppy. Um, I had a dog that I imported here and he wasn't very good when we imported him. He was very young though. And he was going through, I think, a fear stage. All of a sudden, he came out of that fear stage, and he just, he was just an absolute beast, like one of the best dogs I ever imported. And I'm pretty sure they would not have sold him had they seen what kind of dog he would become. I contacted the owner of the kennel, quite a well-known kennel, by the way, and the owner is very successful in the sport. Successful recently, I should say. He had two puppies available from another breeding, right? I said, look, I'm looking for another dog like this one. I really like him. Um, I'm not going to keep him for breeding because of, a specific thing, but, um, I would like more, I would like something like this. Are you breeding his mother again? What are you doing? Breeder says, um, I'm not breeding his mother till next year, but I have these two puppies, fantastic puppies, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, well I'll buy one. So I sent him the money. He said, which puppy do you want? I said, you pick for me. Oh, they're the same. I said, that's nonsense. They're not the same. I guarantee you one is, one is better. You know, I said, <laughs> I basically said that in a nice way. I said, like, you know, which one's better. You pick one for me. That's the best one. So he picked the puppy for me and they're still over there in check, by the way, I paid for the dog to have foundation put on him. Right. Cause I don't, I, I don't import puppies. I, I like them to be at least eight months enough before I import them. I want x-rays, all that stuff. Anyways, he import, he, I see this puppy now three months later, I see a video of the puppy. I say, oh, it's decent. Nothing like holy camoly. Uh, not saying that he couldn't be a fantastic dog. I say he looks decent, looks good. Big dog, you know, Looks all right. Then I saw the brother that the guy told me, you know, uh, might not be as good as, as the one that I bought. The brother was one of the best puppies I've ever seen in my life. I said, bro, sell me, wh what are we doing here? Sell me this one. Oh, he's already sold to another guy, probably a guy he knew, right? That's how it works with Europe. This guy, by the way, that I bought from, he doesn't know me personally. I just contacted him out of the blue. He will know me, but he doesn't know me yet. And he sold me the dog that wasn't as good. And I guarantee you with the disparity between those two dogs, 100%, he knew that the one that he didn't sell me was better. And he sold that one to somebody he knew. That's Europe, guys. Not that I haven't gotten good dogs. I've gotten plenty of good dogs from Europe. But again, good for me and good for you are two different things. That's why I've dealt with Europe, right? Anytime I try to buy something from Europe for me specifically, um, I lose most of the time. Generally speaking, it's not good enough. Oh, this is a great dog. They'll tell me. <laughs> they bring the dog here. I'm like, he's a good dog. He's not a great dog. And when I breed, I, I breed only great dogs. Okay. And again, most for, for what I look for, most of you don't want it. But again, breeding is always a downward thing. So if you're breeding dogs of extremes, usually you're not getting extreme puppies. You're getting puppies that are about here. And those are the puppies for you guys. Those are the puppies, good end user dogs, good for police, good for, you know, the average person in the sport, so on and so forth, 
right? So my taste is not everybody's taste. Keep that in mind. So my point is this, the best dogs I've ever gotten, I'll tell you this guys, the best dogs I've ever gotten have been local dogs. Onyx, you guys all know Onyx, right? Now he's in the US uh, living with, um, I guess I'm not gonna say his name um, just for his own privacy, but he's living in the United States. Okay, with somebody who, who looks like he, he loves him very much, taking good care of him. I retired him. I'm happy to see Onyx having such a good life. That dog is from Quebec. If you look at his pedigree, go look up Onyx on Pedigree Database. Onyx Von Diendico, IGP3, okay? One of the best dogs I ever owned. One of the best dogs I've ever owned. And one of the worst pedigrees I've ever seen. Like half the pedigree is pretty much blank. You know where that pedigree came from? That pedigree came from a kennel. And I didn't buy Onyx by accident. I was given a call. Hey, I got this dog. He's a, you know, he's too much for the old guy that owns him. And, and everybody's scared of him. Do you want him? I said, well, sounds right up my alley. Send Onyx down. And they sent him down. And he was dangerous, man. He was a, and I could tell he was all about that life. And he was the kind of dog that I love to have, right? From Quebec. Born in Quebec. Multiple generations on the top half of the pedigree in Quebec. The bottom half, yes, we have Yaver. Uh, Von Takamarda and, and other notable names, Kibitzende, so on and so forth. Tarzan Von Kibitzende's um, uh, grandson, all that type of stuff, right? But the top half of the pedigree, it's nothing. Like you can look on his pedigree and be like, what the heck is this? It looks like pet lines on the top half. It's not pet lines. Those are, I say, those are those are gee lines, right? So Von Diendico is owned by, um, in Quebec. Uh, I, I think he's retired now. I can't. Forgive me if I'm wrong, Guy. I know he doesn't watch YouTube, so it doesn't matter. Um, so Von Diendico in Quebec is owned by um, uh, a, a, an OG man, okay? He's 70, I think he's in his 70s now. Really tough, tough guy, okay? Real tough guy. Um, you can just tell. Um, and uh, he has quite the reputation. And he picks dogs that he likes, and he breeds those dogs. He doesn't follow the SV standards. He doesn't do any of that kind of stuff. He doesn't wait for the judge to tell him, okay, you can breed. He doesn't do any of that. He breeds the kind of dogs he likes, and he likes badass dogs, okay? And especially when he was younger, he, he had some real man-eaters, okay? And he picks the males like that. The females, I don't think he's, again, I, I don't know how he was picking the females, but the males, 100%, he picks only males for himself, the kind of male he likes to, to train, like big, strong dogs that, that that are a little bit, will fight with him a little bit, and real tough dogs. So, of course, it doesn't matter what kind of females you're breeding these dogs to, and he takes a lot of cast-offs. And by cast-offs, I mean the dog chewed up the previous handler and scared the previous handler, so now the dog is for sale, right? That kind of dog. And those type of dogs are the dogs you want uh, sometimes, sometimes in the breeding, right? And he has generations of those dogs. Onyx came from there. And the thing, the reason I bought Onyx was because that kennel also produced two, if you guys watched the vlog I did with Mike where we were off-roading, we were talking about two other dogs that we had from there. Um, and both those dogs were just absolute beasts as well. German Shepherds, you don't see German Shepherds generally with that level of intensity and and, and aggression and, and fantastic dogs, right? Um, so I said, okay, I'll take Onyx. And so Onyx comes from Quebec. Okay, now this other female, this female that I have, where does she come from? She comes from Canada. Yes, both her parents are from Germany, but she was born in Canada. Had this dog, had this puppy been born in Germany, I never would have received it. I would never have had the opportunity to own it. The grass is not always greener on the other side. Um, oh, one more dog, Charlie von Ipso, Gage's mother, also retired now with a, with a loving family. Um, Charlie... Very intense bitch, super intense. She had a little bit on the grips, but the but the everything else was perfect about her. I loved her intensity. One of the hardest um, and and strongest bitches I've ever owned. Okay, um, Charlie came from the United States again. Somebody I knew called me and said, "Hey man, um, I'm 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 not going to be breeding, and I have this bitch. I think she would be good breeding bitch. Would you like her?" You know, I asked about her. I looked at the pedigree. I said, "Hell's to the yeah." I went and I bought her. And I had two really good litters from her and that I retired her. And, you know, Onyx came from that first litter and uh, the, the, sorry, the second litter and the first litter was the herder litter that you saw me do, right? So this is my example. The best dogs I've ever, um, th some of the best dogs, I should say some, some of the best dogs I've ever had because I have some pretty nice ones right now. Um, like Isa, I have another bitch named Diva, really nice. 
Um, you know, I have some nice dogs right now, but the best ones I've ever had in the past that have proven themselves already by now, local dogs, U.S. and Canada. Okay. Grass isn't always greener on the other side. And Europe doesn't necessarily mean better. And a lot of people think that and it's wrong, right? Again, if you're some nobody, I'm not saying nobody like bad. I'm saying nobody like nobody knows you in the, in the, in the sport, in the dog world. And you go and try to buy a dog locally or whatever. Yeah, you're not going to get something particularly good. People aren't going to sell you the best one. Now, if you call me and you say, hey, Haz, these are my aspirations. I want a serious man eater. I say, okay, what, what do you envision? What's your life like with this dog? What do you think this dog is going to be for you and your family? Right? And then they say, oh, uh, you know, I got the kids and the kids have friends, but I want him to be a man eater only when he's supposed to be a man eater, but everything else. And also, I don't have any experience with training and blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, so you don't really want that. And then I'll tell them. I won't, I won't just say, okay, okay, and sell them a dog. I will tell them that's not the dog you, you need. This is what you need, right? I don't, I don't, uh, listen, some breeders, they're like, yeah, 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 here's a dog. <laughs> okay. But this is the thing. Now, if you call me and have had a few of you, hey, has, I want a dog. I need a man eater, blah, 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 blah. Well, I happen to have one as long as you understand all the risks and all the responsibility that comes with such a dog. I do have one or I do have a puppy that I think will turn out like that. Be ready, though. Be ready. It's not going to be rent and tin. You better be ready. So anyways, I think uh, that's enough on breeders. I guess, listen, if you guys want to breed, invest in, in learning about the breed, not just from Google, but actually getting out there, training, seeing what's genetic and what's learned, right? Because a lot of people, you can go and see a lot of, there's a lot of titled IGP females I would never take a puppy from. I know that the female's no good, right? Her mommy spent a lot of time and effort training her, her or her daddy, right? Or, or there's a lot of males that people are breeding around here. I'm like, why? What, what? possible reason would you want to breed him for isn't it he's a decent dog but he's no breeding dog that's another level of dog right so there's a lot of people like i said that are in the sport that still don't breed very well too and that's why it's so hard to find good dogs these days but anyways regardless let's see here let's get into some of these questions guys so start start hitting me with the questions i'm going to start going through them um i finally made from gothenburg Congratulations, Jesse. I'm glad you made it. How early can dominance aggression be identified in puppies? Best route to tackle it. Um, well, I can identify it relatively early. Also depends on the lines, right? I'll, I'll see it relatively early. How best to tackle it? Not engage in fights that you're not going to win. Minimize conflict. Build trust with the dog. But also, there'll be a time when you have to show him, hey, man, I really mean it. If you have a dog who's seriously rank aggressive, right? Like who's seriously rank dominant and you don't know what you're doing and it's a working dog, like a Dutchie, you see this a lot in the Dutchies, by the way, it's not for you guys. It's not for you. It's, it, you're just not going to be able to handle it. Okay. I've, I've dealt with a few that are really like that. Now, when most people say, when they see this is, oh, he's nipping me and he doesn't listen when I tell him to stop. Well, we're not talking about rank dominance. We're talking about typical puppy behavior. Um, let me see here. No matter what I do, my 15-month-old GSD is super reactive. Heidi Kim. Yeah, uh, you've choked her out, lifted her by the collar, prong correction, try to ignore. Well, your problem is you're trying 100 different things. Um, you're trying 100 different things. Um, what you need to do is you need to make a, a, a correction that's biblical, right? Whether it's a leash correction, I guarantee you. Now, maybe it's a physicality issue. Maybe you're just not physically able to do it. Like I said, I'm working on a course for the reactive dogs and it's going to be available to all my elite members at a discount because I know a lot of you are struggling with this issue. Um, <laughs> the challenge for me in the course is the filming because I've already done a really good intro um, and I've shown some dogs. The problem is, so like I'll get a dog in. It'll be reactive. I'll have the before video. I'll literally run my loose leash walking on the dog and then take him in public and I got nothing. He won't, he won't go. He might pull, he won't go. And what I say when people say, oh, the loose leash walking is good until we see another dog, nine times out of 10, it's not good. One finger. Can you walk him on one finger? Right? And then when you see that other dog, why is it not good anymore? 
What are you doing? What are you not doing? Usually it's an intensity issue. And then people are like, okay, that doesn't work. Let me try this. That doesn't work. Let me try that. And they're jumping to a hundred different things instead of just say, you know what? I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this a lot until I see a suppression in the behavior. If I don't see a suppression in the behavior, I know I didn't do it properly. That's usually what it is. But again, look, to some degree, we're online. You're probably going to have to work with a trainer if you can't get the reactivity addressed on your own. Uh, I bought one of your Andrew Clays. Oh, hey, Andrew. So impressed with his prey and environmental stability. Never go to. Oh, thanks, man. Let me know how he does. Eh? Keep us up to date. Send me some pictures. Send me some videos. I love to hear from my puppies, even if it's years down the road. Um, I'm looking for a working line Doberman breeder. So here's my thing with that. Okay, so most Dobermans, I'm going to say this right off the hop. In terms of work, 99.9% .9 of Dobermans, absolutely useless. Um, it's very, very, people ask me, why don't you use Dobermans? It's extremely hard to find a Doberman that's worth feeding. And I say that again, from a working perspective, not enough. We train lots of Dobermans here as pets. No problemo. Okay, very easy to train them. Um, there's literally maybe two breeders in the world who I've seen... Sorry, hold on, my dog. Hey, knock it off. Go on your place. Go, place. <laughs> anyway, um, I've seen literally about two breeders in the world whose Dobermans I might take. Neither of those, so there's Landgraf Dobermans in California. And then there's another girl, I think she's in North Carolina. I actually messaged her for a Doberman and... Um, she uh, initially replied that she doesn't want to sell because she knows I'm going to sell it after I train it. I said, okay, I mean, your Doberman would only be all over YouTube and everybody would know that you'd be the place to go for Dobermans, but whatever. And then I, I did message her again um, and then she didn't reply. So I'm not going to shout her out, to be quite frank. Um, but they do exist. It's just very, very rare. And you're probably going to be on a waiting list. Um, point being... Uh, it's very hard to find good Dobermans. And then you're usually having big health issues with them as well. What do you think about, sorry, guys, I skipped a bunch of questions here. Let me go back up here. Um, what do you think about Switzerland Shepherd? You mean like Swiss, the, 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 the white German Shepherds? Not particularly uh, useful. Um, other than as pets, quick question, how dog does great off leash healing and everything else. How do I introduce friend or family when they enter my house? You don't Sergey. So Sergey's asking what he's in the course. He's asking, what do I do with friends and family? Um, when they come over, you don't stop making it an issue. Stop making it a thing. This is the problem. A lot of people have is they're always, they're making events. They're making, they're creating arousal where there doesn't need to be any. My dog waits on his bed. He waits on his place. When people come in, he waits on his place and he's quiet. Hey guys, come on in leave the dog alone. That's what I do. And then guess what? The dog calms down and he's like, okay, there's people here. Now, if I have a dog like Gage, my dog, and he's social, he only likes my family and me. I, he can handle other people being in the house, but he's not going to like them. Okay. So I'm not going to do, there's not going to be any introductions. These people don't live here, so he doesn't need to be introduced to them. He's going to be over there and they're going to be over there. And that's what we're going to do if I even have him out. Okay. Now, if I have a social dog, no problem. Once he's calm and the arousal is low, then I'll let him out. And I'll be like, okay, guys. But if your dog's not social, don't do it. You're, there's literally nothing to gain. Uh, uh, German Shepherds are 4,000 in, 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 uh, uh, Australia. Yeah, they are. Uh, Australia is a very um, difficult. I think there's like a big quarantine issue with getting dogs into Australia. So anytime you have a closed market like that, of course, prices are going to be high. But really, for, I would think they would be more than $4,000. Uh, Jeff, thanks for the email advice. Warming up before bite work. Ruger's front leg is healed, working back into it slowly. So yeah, um, you've got to be really careful. Uh, if you're going to be doing anything high intensity, like bite work, always warm your dog up first before you take the dog. Don't take the dog cold. If you take your dog cold, you can do all sorts of soft tissue injuries. Some of it's permanent, right? 
You break a cruciate ligament, especially if you have a big dog, you got to be really, really careful. Um, what do you think about line breeding? It's really good if it's done on proper individuals. So one of the best litters of puppies I've ever had, okay, came recently from a dog that I intentionally purchased because she comes from a breeder, Staatsmacht in the United States, that line breeds. He's line breeded for, uh, he does a lot of line breeding for several generations, but I know he's line breeding on legitimate dogs, healthy dogs. And more, more, more importantly, even for me than health is the working quality of the dogs is extreme. He's a line breeding and he has a very consistent, like the funny thing about uh, Stefan's dogs is some of his dogs aren't to my taste, but I know in the whelping box bred to a dog of my taste, they're going to produce fantastic dogs. So I bred a bitch I got from him to Onyx very recently, and I got some fantastic puppies, fantastic puppies, like really good consistency in the litter. Um, you know, two or three of those puppies were really good. Um, I really, I, listen, when you line breed, you're setting a type. If you're doing it properly and you're lining breeding on the right individuals, you're setting a type and you're saying, this is me, this is me, this is my line, right? And if you know anything about Stefan, I got to do a, a, an interview with him or something if he'll if he's willing to do it. He's a he's a character, guys. If you if you know anything about Stefan, he has a line. He's one of the few breeders in North America that has a specific line, multiple generations of his dogs that have produced and performed at really high levels and are in the pedigrees of a lot of the best dogs that are on the field today. Uh, do you think regulation of dog breeding is possible? Absolutely not. If we haven't learned anything from the last two years, guys, two weeks to flatten the curve. You want the government involved? The government has no business in anything, much less dog breeding, okay? The government needs to fi fix the potholes and, uh, you know, prevent anarchy. That's about it. I don't want the government involved in literally anything, okay? Um, and if, hey, that's a, that's a, uh, if you're one person that's for big government, then listen, looking to the government, you know what, you know what the solution is? The solution is educated buyers, right? The American car industry, they were selling garbage for a couple decades. What happened? Buyers got educated. They said, you know what? These domestic cars are garbage. We're going to buy uh, these imports. We're going to buy these Japanese cars and these Chinese cars and whatever else. And what happened? The Americans had to improve their product. Otherwise, they couldn't compete. It's the same with the breeding. Raise awareness. Hey, your dog isn't bad because of some mystery. Your dog, your dog has all these issues because your breeder doesn't know what the hell she's doing. I did a post like that a while ago and it kind of blew up a little bit, which wasn't my intention, but that's what I mean though. I got frustrated. I saw this dog and I'm like, the owners were totally screwed over with that dog. They totally didn't get what they paid for. And it was because the breeder made a really bad decision, right? The breeder, again, someone who probably shouldn't have been breeding at all. Well, not probably, definitely shouldn't have been breeding at all doesn't know what she's looking at, doesn't know what she's doing, produced some really dogs that really struggle with life, right? But that's par for the course. Um, Arash, Lily is going to probably be a family dog for my parents. I bought a dog with terrible genetics, but she taught me a lot. Well, Arash, you live, you learn, buddy. Uh, I checked out your website for your pups. Is the current list up to date? Vito and Cypher. Yeah, it's up to date. Um, I think there might be a couple on there that I haven't. Sometimes, guys, I, I haven't put puppies up. Sometimes I'm behind on the website. Sometimes I'm on it. Um, but I think right now it is relatively up to, to um, uh, it's on everything there is. Um, every every puppy on my website is available. Cypher is a really nice bitch if you're looking for a, a herder puppy. She's a 50-50 German Shepherd Melwa. Um I actually tested her uh, very recently. I was like, wow, you know, one of those puppies is hanging off the tug, really nice intensity. I, I think she's going to be a real nice, nice female. Um, I'm looking for a Doberman with good genes and nerves. Yeah, we already talked about the Dobies, man. Uh, refer back to that. Uh, da, 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 da. Shanice, check out Benchmark Dobermans. Shanice. That's the lady I was talking about. I didn't shout her out, but you did. So we'll let it go. <laughs> um, how is your little German Shepherd puppy with the little size? Oh, you know that dog? You know who you're talking about? You're talking about, um, we call her uh, Jada. Okay. 
Jada is fine. I kept Jada back. Um, I, I sold her brothers and sisters. Um, some of them I kept back for training. Uh, Jada is perfectly fine. She's just really little, really little, like nice puppy, perfect dog for family. Um, she's like a German shepherd, but like somebody hit it with a shrink ray, right? She's going to be maybe like 45, 50 pounds, <laughs> full grown, very nice German shepherd. Um, good health. Uh, we've trained her as a family dog. Um, she isn't on the website yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to, you know, get some footage of her and pictures and then she'll be up there. Uh, ba, 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 ba. How about working dogs for search and rescue? Would you sell for those purposes? Listen, search and rescue is single purpose work, right? So there's plenty of dogs that can do it. Um, like if I'm breeding for law enforcement, what's law enforcement? They need hunt drive. They need courage. They need stability. They need prey drive. Um, they need good grips, so on and so forth. Um, it, it's actually easier to produce single purpose dogs than it is to produce dual purpose dogs. So for sure. I mean, uh, definitely herding cattle and sheep. I don't, I don't do herding now. We're listen. There are a lot of people that they go to like the sheep farm and their dog chases sheep around. And, you know, it's like something that the sheep farm offers or herding courses or whatever. Most of it's nonsense, herding instinct tests or whatever. It's nonsense in my opinion. Um, and it's definitely not the basis by which I would select um, dogs for breeding. Um, but if you want a herding dog, go listen. There's guys in the southern United States, especially they do a lot of cow dogs, right? They do a lot of, uh, I think out of West, Western Canada too. They do like dogs specifically that have been bred for generations and not only bred, they do it on the ranch with these dogs. And those dogs are not cheap, but you can go and buy one for that. Um, what's your website? Uh, it's in the description, shieldk9.ca. Uh, why didn't I go to the Czech Republic? Well, Matt, <laughs> have you, uh, looked around lately? <laughs> it's not, I don't, I don't fancy being quarantined when I come back. I don't even know if I'm allowed to leave the country right now. Um, no, it's not, I'm not saying the breeder's name and it's not Wendell and Farm. Can you train working line for protection? Well, of course. That's that's what a working line is. Uh, okay, guys. My working line GST was thought to be overly aggressive. He turned out amazing at protection. It's often the case. Aggression is something that a lot of people don't know what they're looking at when they see it. Okay? Like true aggression. What a lot of people characterize as aggression is just a, a hyper-aroused young dog that hasn't been taught any manners. Oh, he's so aggressive. And it's just like, hey, dude. Calm down. Calm down. <clears throat> okay. That's usually what, what we get when people say that they've got an aggressive dog. What is the problem with DDR German Shepherds? Well, the problem is that the only people that like them are people that don't know anything about the dogs. Listen, I'll say this about DDR dogs. Oh, has you don't know DDR this, DDR that. Listen, look at anybody who's performing in the sport, okay? Top performing dogs in the sport. Um not even top performing, halfway decent performing. There's no DDR. Nobody that looks for a working dog says, I want a DDR dog. Never. We know. They're useless, right? The only breeders that are breeding them, they're generally big dogs. They look good. And they appeal to people that uh, know, know about dogs on the internet, but not in real life, right? They're usually low drive, uh, poor nerves, and um, sometimes the health isn't so good. But, you know, they're not working dogs in any capacity anymore, um, you know, uh, true DDR dogs that have pedigree, that's like pure DDR from that era. If you happen to find one that's actually like legitimate, there's a lot of DDR dogs that in my opinion, they're not really DDR dogs if you want to be a purist about it. But regardless, listen, the Eastern German Shepherd, the, the German, the, the Europe, right? The DDR dogs. I've gotten a lot of dogs from, from Eastern Europe. Okay. And those type of dogs you know, they can be good uh, family dogs if you, if there's enough courage there. But uh, these days, no one's breeding that courage not, not or the prey. Now, I've had one, I've had a few where there's some West German in there and it's okay. You know, still not my cup of tea, but it's okay. And I've sold a few, um, but no, they're, they're, DDR dogs is all hype and people that really don't know much are the ones that really promote it and push it. And fantastic stories and so police, police sport anyone that actually does things with their dogs like real things we don't mess with the gtr dogs um i'm in the caitlin 
When working on the long line, auto won't go far enough for me to be able to work his recall. Um, so what I will do then for this is I will generally what why your dog won't leave is one of two reasons. Reason number one, you called him too much. And he's like, I know what this is. Every time I leave, you call me. So why would I leave? Reason number two, or is the dog's a little bit nervous and doesn't like to leave you because you're their security blanket. What I do for dogs like that then is um, I'll put a very thin long line on the dog, like uh, like a hollow polypropylene line, and I'll let the dog go and just drag the line. And then I'll work the recalls like that. And generally, if they stick really close to you all the time, Sometimes just feeling that like the, the lack of the long line and taking it off the pinch, maybe even putting it on a flat collar um, will encourage the dog to leave. Also, sometimes people aren't working around enough distractions and the dog's not motivated to leave. You go to a place with a lot of smell, a lot of distraction, the dog leaves you. Don't call him right away. Let him be out there for a bit. Let him experience being out there, have fun, uh, smell the grass, whatever it is he wants to do, and then call him once in a blue moon. Uh, Mitchell. Eight-month-old Mel will not out. Tried the two ball. Tried what you showed on the video. He just says nothing I do to him is worth giving it up. Well, Mitch, um, generally speaking, if your dog won't out on the prong collar, I've met very few eight-month-old Mel ones that wouldn't. Um, I would probably think that you're not correcting him. And a lot of... Uh-oh. Sorry, guys. Anyways, like I said, piece number one of the L, letting go. Piece number two, you get it again. A lot of dogs don't understand this. And once they do understand it, all of a sudden, you see that light bulb flicker on. Eight months old, I would say for sure on pinch collar should work. If it, if you're struggling, put the dog, uh, put a flat collar on your dog, back tie him to a post or something, and then have the pinch collar. And then you can... Make a little bit, tell him out, and then just pull forward towards you. Obviously, you're not over top of the dog, you're back. And then when he lets go, immediately come off the pinch. Go bite it again, buddy. Uh, what startup budget does one need to start a breeding pro operation? Um, well, listen, I listen, like, I mean, to get a real good puppy these days, you probably, you're, you're going to want to buy probably a, one or two females. Um, from really good lines. Um, and those females aren't going to be available right away. Like the female like I was telling you about that I got locally, that female wouldn't have been available to me had I not known those people. You need to, that's what I mean. You have to get out there a little bit, get to know some people, unless you get lucky, right? Unless you get lucky and, and you just, you know, are able to buy a, a breeding quality female right off the hop, which definitely can happen. I've sold a few where I've regretted it. And I've been like, man, that bitch turned out way better than I thought she would. And, and the bitch is like living in somebody's home as a pet. It's fantastic. Uh, but that's the way it goes. You know, um, the average good quality German Shepherd puppy, four to five G's. Um, then you're going to have to wait two years uh, or at least a year um, if you're going to get SV hips and elbows. Um, so hips and elbows run you about $4,000. Training, club fees, so on and so forth. Um, sorry, hips and elbows are going to run you four or five, eh, no, but probably about five, 600 bucks. And you should x-ray the back as well. Um, and do a DM test. I mean, DM tests are a little bit, eh, you know, I just, if, if I have a dog that's a carrier and a dog that's not a carrier, like for me, Onyx was a carrier, but I still bred him because he was better than anything available locally. Um, and Hey, he proved himself in the whelping box time and time again. Um, but anyways, point being, um, you're probably looking 4,000 for the puppy, uh, training, probably at least another thousand bucks a year, um, uh, equipment, who knows <laughs> another 500 food, 500, right? Uh, so now we're at what? 55, $6,000, uh, x-rays and other. So probably by the time you're about 18 months in and you say, okay, the bitch has, passing hips and elbows. She has good character. You've already spent about $6,500 to $7,000. Okay. That's if you're buying a puppy. Now, if you want to buy a good quality female, that's 
able to breed that should be bred, not, hey, this dog's not very good. So as a breeder, I'm just going to get rid of it. Okay. I personally don't sell dogs for breeding that I don't think should be bred, but other breeders will, you know? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, look, you're going to be spending probably about that seven, eight, uh, for a really nice one. You'll be in the double digits for sure. You know, um, like for me, if you wanted my, like one of my best breeding females, you'd be paying me 15 to $18,000. Right. And, and it's not very much different if you go overseas. Um, you know, that's what it is. Um, and, and, uh, that's for one female, right now you're going to have to pay a stud fee. I don't ever recommend buying a male for breeding. People always do this, right? They say, oh, I'm going to buy this male and breed them to my female. Number one. If you're doing that, probably your female is not good for breeding because you don't know enough to be able to determine that she is. But let's say she's good for breeding. Okay. You're buying a male. And listen, people do this. They buy dogs from me and they say, oh, I'm going to breed this dog, blah, blah, blah. I say, at first I was like, God, I don't want to sell people dogs. But then I was like, you know what? If I don't sell them this dog, what's going to happen? They're going to go to someone with a much worse dog than this dog and they're going to breed to it. Right? You never need to buy it. Here's why you don't need to buy a male for breeding. And I'm probably talking myself out of money here. You don't need to buy a male for breeding because you literally have access to the best males in North America. And you're only going to pay like a $2,000 stud fee and drive. Yeah, it might be a long drive. But when you add that, when you compare that to how much it's going to actually cost you, let's say you could get your hands on a top male. Listen, I know of males, top quality males that came from Europe. We're talking like a 50,000 50, euros, guys. They're not cheap. They're not cheap, okay? And again, that's if you know somebody. If you don't know somebody, you're probably just going to get somebody's cast off sport dog. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's good for breeding, <laughs> right? That's what you're going to get. So uh, this is uh, buying males generally doesn't make much sense unless you really know what you're looking for. Buy good females, raise them, train them, and there will be males around you. You pay $1,000, $2,000, you get to use them for breeding, and you don't have to look after them, train them, or any of that kind of stuff. That's always the best way. Again, I will sell males. Like I have people that buy, hey, I want to breed, blah, blah, blah. I say, what's your female? As long as it's not like, you know, if you've got a working line female and she looks half decent, okay, fine. I'll sell you, I'll sell you a male. I still recommend, you know, that you do what I'm talking about doing, but you know, it's better, better that than, than what a lot of people resort to, which is, Hey, you got a male. I got a female. Let's put them together. Don't do that. Uh, many really good Doberman come out of Russia. Eh. I don't know, Dylan. I don't know. I haven't seen them. Post videos of those dogs. Post videos of those dogs. We'll look at them. Um, uh, I've heard all these, oh, the European Doberman. I've seen plenty of Do Dobermans from Europe. Nothing really impressive there. I'm looking at a 2-3 breeding. Well, it depends on, 2-3, by the way, refers to an inbreeding, guys. Depends on the individuals. Depends on who's doing that breeding. Um, how do you become an elite member, Ricky? Well, you, uh, join my online course, shieldk9.ca. You will see an online course, um, that you, you join and, and that's who I'm referring to when I'm talking about my elite members. My neighbor has a superior male rotting in his backyard. Well, it's always possible. There's a saying, some of the best dogs are out there in backyards, but usually when you hear about them, the person telling you about them doesn't know enough to tell you that it doesn't know enough for you to say, okay, yeah, that's for sure a, a really good dog, right? How to apply punishment without tools? Well, I don't like really getting into that um, on online because, it, again, I find that people really aren't able to um, – take that information and actually use it because they don't, they, they can't read dogs the way I can read dogs or the way maybe a professional trainer can read dogs. But suffice to say, you don't need a tool to correct a dog, right? What is a correction? A correction is the application of aversive control to a specific behavioral contingency. Well, there's a lot of ways to do that if you really think about it. Um, but stop leaving your dog loose in your house and you'll probably resolve a lot of those problems. How do you break his focus? I don't break focus. You know what I'll do? I'll intentionally, oh, okay. Um, so if you have a dog that does this every time they see another dog and they, a lot of people try to play the focus game. I don't play focus games. My dogs focus on me because they learned that it's terrible to not focus on me, right? I don't play, oh, focus, look at me, look at me. I don't do any of that nonsense. 
and say, okay, I'm going to do loose leash walking. Oh, you want to look at that dog? No problem. I'm going to walk as fast as I can towards that dog. I'm going to hit the brakes and God help you if you miss this. Hit the brakes, dog runs into the end. Bang, big correction. I'll do it again until I guarantee I hit the brakes. That dog hits the brakes with me and looks at me because he realizes there's a dog over there and you might be interested in him, but believe me, I'm a lot more important to your life, right? I don't play focus games. I say, oh, you want to look at that other dog? Okay, no problem. I'm going to set you up to make mistakes because you're thinking about that other dog instead of me. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to escalate my level of correction until I become more important than that other dog. But I'm not going to ask too much. I'm just going to be like, hey, you just got to walk on a loose leash. Um, bah, 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 bah. How do I make my dog, my Springer, a protection dog? You don't. You buy a dog that's been bred for that type of work. We don't do off breeds. Uh, can you talk about Dutchies? I've had a few Dutchies. Um, I had a couple Dutchies from Logan House Kennels. I've trained quite a few here. We get a lot of Dutchies in from people that mistakenly bought them as pets. Don't do that. Um, I can count on the finger of one hand Dutchies that I would say probably could live in a home with the average person. I know I want a protection dog. I don't want a pet dog. Yeah, you want a pet dog. Trust me. Most people, unless you really know what the hell you're doing, you you have no business with a Dutchie. They're, they, they can be really nasty, um, really uh, a lot of handler issues. It's very common. Um, they can be very uh, reactive. There's a lot. There's more bad ones than good ones. And I'm not saying bad ones in terms of their behavior, but in terms of the quality. And when Dutchies are bad, they're bad, like really bad. I don't know what it is. Um, I think just breeders really don't know what the hell they're doing. And um, Dutchie is one of the worst dogs um, for – that I rep that, that I think uh, anyone should own. Um, I know where to get good Dutchies, but I don't personally carry any because for me, they're not an easy dog to sell. Um, the average family can't handle them. The average police department can't handle them. There's way really for me, a lot of problems. Um, like for sure, there's some really good ones out there. Um, just like I said, if you have to ask about them, they're probably not the breed for you. Uh, what would you do if they ban prong and e-collar? Well, Roderick, I will do what the old school European guys are doing right now. <laughs> you think aversive control is limited to a prong and an e-collar? Prong and an e-collar is a humane solution to aversive control. It's probably one of the most humane ways to apply negative reinforcement and positive punishment. Right? The, way, the reason they invented them was because they're more efficient and they're more humane for the dog and they cause a lot less conflict. You can do it without those things though. Uh, and also my prices would go up because things are going to take longer now. Uh, do you think massive breeds will ever go back to their original various purposes? No. Listen, working breeds as a whole, as a whole, there's going to be much less of them. I'm going to explain to you guys why working breeds as a whole is gone. It are, 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 are slowly dying out. So number one, police departments. Okay. Um, police departments more and more. There's, of course, with all the social justice and all this type of stuff, there's this idea that uh, it's somehow uh, morally horrendous for police to use um, dogs um, as, a, as, as tools to apprehend people. When in reality, um, if you know anything about the, the uh, apprehension dogs and police dogs, they actually save a lot of lives. Um, they cause a lot of people to surrender before you actually have to you know, use potentially deadly force with them. Um, and, uh, they're wonderful deterrents, um, you know, when you bring them to a, a situation, a lot of the time, just the presence of the police dog diffuses the situation and believe me, being apprehended by a police dog is a lot better than being shot. So, um, but regardless, uh, there's a bigger and bigger push now to leave the dogs that do the bike work and go more exclusively into dogs, only single purpose dogs that only uh, do scent detection and tracking. So, of course, this is going to impact the quality of the dogs. In Europe, um, there's a lot of bans on uh, any kind of devices, right? E-collars, prong collars. Gage, place. E-collars. I said place. Dogs testing me. E-collars and prong collars um, being banned. And like you said, a lot of even some places, it's, it's, it's illegal to just correct your dog, period. doesn't matter what you use. 
So of course, this is going to impact the kind of dogs that are being bred. And I posted a post about that on my posts, right? Um, that Barb Bellon did. Like there's a big change already in the type of dogs that people are selecting for competition. And the competition is really important, not because most a lot of people do it. Competition is very niche. There's very few people that compete with their dogs, but competition is where the breeding stock comes from that everybody else uses, where all the police dogs, the military dogs, they all come from competition dogs. That's the breeding stock. So when you start to select worse and worse breeding stock because of the new, um, more enlightened rules that we're seeing these days, what happens to the overall quality of the dogs? They become less and less. You'll have guys like me that as long as I'm breeding, I will never breed those types of dogs. I'm always going to breed harder, more kind of primal type dogs. I say primal because like the dogs I like to breed are more like independent. Um, they're more harder. They're dogs that in my, like they cannot be properly trained without the use of aversives. For me, if, if a dog can be properly trained without the use of aversives, there it's missing something. And there's a level of, uh, there's a sensitivity and a nervousness in the dog that will manifest in, in future generations. I have no interest in reproducing that. Um, and believe me, I've seen what can happen when you breed overly sensitive dogs. They can be trained with minimum to no aversive control. Um, so I'm not interested. Um, but uh, yes, working breeds are becoming less and less in style. There's many places that are going to be banning bite work. Um, banning aversives, all that type of stuff. So it's going to become, a, they're going to become an endangered species very soon. I plan to continue to breed them just for myself. Um, so, you know, but listen, as they're, as they become less and less, I, I think prices are going to go up in my opinion. Where do you find your puppy site? Well, if you go on my website, shieldcanine.ca, you'll see a link to my, my dog, my dog available dogs website. That's shieldcanine.dogs.com. If someone buys a working pup prospect to compete with, but ends up not being a good prospect, uh, no, there's no refund. There's uh, re uh, so what breeders should offer is replacements. Okay, so um, most breeders will not offer a refund. Um, now I will say this, Alexis. To some now, some breeders take this too far. They always blame the the owner. Oh, you didn't do this. You didn't do that properly. Blah blah blah. And I've definitely seen a lot of owners that really screw up. A dog. There are certain owners. <laughs> there are certain people I know. They said, "Hey, has sell me a uh, working dog." I say, "Who are you working with?" And they tell me who they're working with. I say, "I'm not going to sell you one because you're not going to be successful because that person breaks dogs. They don't make dogs, right?" There's the genetic traits, and then there's also the training. Now, listen, I've definitely seen it a lot where the breeder blames always the training and never takes responsibility for the lack of quality coming from their kennel. Um, I will say I've never had to make good on a working guarantee yet because I, I always pick winners, but that's for now. I mean, I'm sure at some point I'll pick a loser and um, I will replace the puppy. Do you find any dogs that throw themselves not in first and second? For sure. There's many uh, dogs that will throw themselves in grand granted. This is what I hope to achieve with my herder breeding. Um, sorry guys. You hear my son again. Um, so with my herder breeding, um, it was, this is, this is what I did, right? Uh, I, I'm actually more after the grandparents in that breeding, um, especially on the female side. So uh, yes, for sure. I've seen it. Fleischerheim. I don't know Fleischerheim, Blue Diamond. Uh, I'm a pet dog trainer. Um, currently training dog that has a moving problem. She doesn't want to. Dog is very sensitive, owner snowflake sensitive. I want to use e-collar. Yeah, don't. This is what I always say, you know, like people always come to me as a trainer. Like there's always those people. Oh, there's always, oh, oh everything you do is, is they're crying and they're emotional and everything's a big deal. And I say to them, listen, if you want to train with me, this is how it's going to be. You don't like it, go train with somebody else. I don't try to cajole people into things. Oh, um, why should I use an e-collar? Because I told you to use an e-collar. I mean, we could spend an hour for me explaining why you should use it. But at this point in my, in my, I've never actually been the type of person that to, to try and convince you to do anything. Are you happy with where you and your dog are at right now? Yes. Good. Keep doing what you're doing. No. Well, if you want me to help you get somewhere where you are happy, um, you better listen up, close your mouth, open your ears, because I'm going to show you how to do it. But if you want to tell me what to do, then I'm just going to let you do what you're doing. Right. That's my advice. I, I don't. I don't cajole people into anything. I don't sell people on anything. It's like, you know, listen, you do what you want to do. 
I'm going to tell you how to get where you want to go. If you don't want to listen, no problem. Go, go do whatever you want to do. Uh, any advice on raw feeding? Yeah, it can be good. Nutrition plays a role. Um, nutrition plays quite a role, actually. So I've seen a lot of people. I actually just got a dog back that I sold. Fantastic working dog. His name was Chapo. Um, and he just came back to me for more protection training. And the dog came back fat, man. Like fat. I'm like, bro. <laughs> I called the guy. I'm like, why, why is he so fat? Oh, I feed him two pounds a day. Like, man, people will follow the... The, the feeding instructions, hey, get on your place. Dog's making me look bad, man. Came off his place. Anyways, um, people will follow the feeding instructions to, to like, they'll ignore what their eyes are telling them. The dog is fat. I don't care how much the bag is telling you to feed. I don't care how much the breeder told you to feed. Your dog is fat. Stop feeding. Lower how much you're feeding. You don't need to give them diet food or any other nonsense. Just reduce the amount that you're feeding, right? Dog came back fat and the work that he's able to put out is like he gets tired really fast. Like he still wants to do it, but he gets retired really fast. I've 100% also seen many dogs um, who have really bad behavioral issues and they lose some weight and also get good training because that's what happens here. Um, and the behavioral issues improve. So for sure, just like with people, I mean, with people, if you're really fat, you're going to have emotional issues and you're going to have physical issues. I, I don't think it would be any different for dogs. AJ, my man, did you keep any pups from your J litter? If so, what level of training are they at right now? J litter. I've had a lot of litters. It's hard to remember now. J. Um, AJ, I'm drawing a blank, man. Like, I, I know I had a J litter. <laughs> I can't tell you. I can't tell you what litter. I, um, oh, is it your litter? Yes, it is. Oh, that's um, uh, that's Eddie and um, Cece. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I did keep one. Well, no, actually, I didn't keep him because he's sold. He sold as a uh, level two dog. We're just starting bite work with him. Um, but he's one of those dogs. He grew really weird, like really long legs and stuff. But like the uh, like he he looks like a like a baby deer right now. Like really is like his legs are like adult size, but his body is like still like puppy size. I'm letting him finish growing normally before I do any more with him. But um, there's a couple of those puppies that we've sold fully obedience trained. Uh, I have a female with ears that don't stand completely. Well, look, I, I don't, I've seen a really nice female with soft ears that I would breed to um, a really like, and she's like a fantastic working dog. She has one soft ear. Um, I, I, and I know the person that owns her, they bred her to a male that had really, um, who's also a fantastic working dog, but had really good ears and the puppies all came with good ears. So I always say it depends on the dog. Um, another question about Doberman. I've already answered the Doberman stuff. I'm not going to get into it. Just, I'm just going to say, listen, they lack the nerve. They lack the drive. They lack the health. That's why I generally don't deal with them. Um, I know that there are exceptions to the rule, but it's more than average. Like it, it, there's a lot watching from Florida, man. I'm jealous. I want to be in Florida right now. Custom canine. And I might be soon. We'll see. Uh, GSD barks at other dogs. Does not pull or lunge on the lead. Just barks. Eh, it's not about the prong. Just tell your puppy, Hey, knock it off, man. That's the age when they all bark. What's your opinion on Preza Canarios? Darren. Um, well, I mean, look, I breed them. I used to breed them, I should say. And my good friend James breeds them. Uh, James at Iron Gate, Preza Canario. Shout out to you, James. And depends what you're looking for in a dog. If you want a sport dog, it's not the dog. If you want a good guard dog, certain breedings will produce a good guard dog. Um, the reason I got out of them was there was a consistency. Like for me, I won't breed a dog that doesn't have good hips and elbows. And a lot of them won't pass on the elbows or the hips. Like it won't be like a, a big fail, but it'll be enough of a fail that for me, I didn't like it. And also I didn't like, I wasn't getting the consistency and the working traits that I want. Like I know a lot of people, there's some people that really, they've been breeding for many, many generations, but like, you know, I did one generation with the Prezas and I said, you know what, this isn't for me. I'm going to focus on the German Shepherds. I'm very happy that I did. How much does the mother raising the puppies affect the pups? I'm thinking reactive mothers being visited by humans and barking. No. No, you know, there's this big myth. I think it, like the, the impact of the mother on the behavior of the puppies is so over, overdone. 
And I'll tell you why. I was going to do a video on this. You know, there's this belief that, like, if you take the puppies away too soon, it changes. Like, listen, I've had two puppies I've had to take away really fast. One puppy, the mom just wouldn't feed him. Okay? And uh, German Shepherd puppy recently. Mom wouldn't feed him. Um, and actually, you can see him on my YouTube channel. His name is Potato. Okay? <laughs> Some girl that used to work for me um, at the time, she raised him literally from, like, one week old. That puppy has got to be one of the most social puppies I've ever seen, okay? And it makes complete sense. You know why? Because that puppy literally went everywhere with her. Um, he was around many dogs and he was around many people because, you know, she gets out of her house and, you know, she was working here at the time when she was raising him, so on and so forth. That puppy got way more socialization than the average puppy ever gets by his age because literally he had to go with her everywhere since she had to feed him like every few hours, okay? Okay. I had a press of puppy as well that I raised because uh, one of his litter mates attacked him. I think he was like four or five weeks, four weeks. Yeah, something like that. And she ripped him up. Like he had to go to the emergency vet. Like he almost died. Like press us, right? So anyways, um, I raised him. And again, one of the most social puppies I've ever had. So the two puppies that I took earliest from the moms were the most social puppies I've ever seen. OK, um, and I've definitely had puppies from reactive mothers. So, AJ, if you're watching this boss, your puppy, I know, you know, he's social, right? A lot of that's from Cece. Cece is a reactive bitch, right? Like in the kennel, she's just an asshole in the kennels. She's one of those dogs. Like you take her in public, she's fine, but she's an asshole in the kennel. All the puppies from that breeding, very social puppies. And believe me, their father, Eddie, is the same. He's an asshole in the kennel too. Reactive. He barks at anybody. If you don't know him, you better not put your hand in his kennel. Very social puppies. It is what it is. My end litter, also from CC, right? And Onyx, if you know anything about Onyx, he does not take kindly to strangers. Very social, right? And both parents are not social. And mommy definitely is not social, especially when she has puppies in the whelping box. So no, I, I really put almost zero um zero uh impact on the sociability of the puppies from mom like beyond the genetics that she's passing the experience i really don't put much value in it at all because i haven't seen anything in all the litters that i've had that make me believe that mom has a big impact on the dogs other than what she passes to them genetically uh vermeer picked up our dog from board and train yesterday didn't get a chance to thank you in person just want to say the results were amazing. Well, thanks, man. I'm glad that you, um, I'm glad that you uh, got what you wanted, and I hope you come back and uh, do your refresher and stay on your dog. He's only going to be as good now as your maintenance, right? Because all behavior degrades, especially behavior that's not self-satisfying to the dog. So it's important for you to maintain all the behaviors in the dog. When picking, and we'll help you with that, of course. When picking, uh, Nathan, when picking one of your level two or three dogs, how long does that individual need to spend there to make a better transition? Uh, you mean like to you? Um, generally, all our puppies that we train here leave between 10 and 14 months, depending on the training, and they all make good transitions. I've never really had one that didn't make a good transition because we're selecting individuals that are very stable. Um, what are your opinion on rottweilers becoming popular again i've had some i've had a fantastic rottweiler or two here um rottweilers again i don't recommend them for people that really don't know what they're doing um there's a lot of breeders breeding rottweilers i really don't think that they should be breeding them because they don't know what they're doing again they've got dogs that have a lot and then they've got dogs that don't have a lot and they're mixing them together i've seen some terrible combinations and really dangerous dogs i've seen some really badly some really nasty Rottweilers around here, guys. Like, not nasty in a good way. Nasty in an unstable, can't trust them kind of way. Like, not the type of dog I would ever feed. Some A Rottweiler is one of the two dogs that I've ever recommended here be put down to the owner. And I've only ever done that really twice. I said, listen, put this dog down. Right? He was a, he was a dog. Full disclosure, we raised, like, he came here for a puppy board and trained. The owner spent a lot of money on training. And he was good with us when we managed him and all this stuff. And, and, you know, he was a little barky and stuff. And as he got older, he got more and more sketchy with people and stuff like this. But, you know, that, that in and of itself is uncommon. But what happened was she was on a snow hill with the dog. 
and I don't think she was managing him properly. Anyways, the dog, um, I guess one of the kids was going down the hill, and we found this out after the fact, of course. Dog jumped on the kid, grabbed her by the face, and was just holding on to her. It wasn't making noise. He wasn't barking or anything. He was just trying to kill the child. 60 stitches to her face. I said, when I heard this, I said, immediately go put him down. This is not a dog that we play games with. There's no training this. There's no rehabilitating this. He's not safe around small children. And he wants to kill them. He's demonstrated that. This is not a dog for, for the family. It's not a dog for life, in my opinion. Uh, do I... Would I do um, obedience workshops in the New York State? Listen, I have not um, been booked yet for 2022. Um, you know, if I'm able to cross the border, I'm open to doing workshops. You know, hit me up if you want me to come and do a workshop. Do you rate Alpine Canine and Janopo dogs? All I'm going to say about those dogs is, is there's a lot of hype there. A lot of hype. And you don't see a lot on the performance side. Uh, I'm, tra I'm training a GSD using your course and it's going well, except she doesn't seem to enjoy playing at all. No matter what I try, she's really food motivated. Then play with the food. Don't just give her the food, like make her chase it a little bit and play with her. There's some dogs like this. Uh, elite member. How can I shrink my dog's roaming radius when working off leash? <laughs> so if you have a dog that likes to turn into a rocket ship on, um, uh, on the break, what you do is you call her back a bunch of times. So you say break, she gets about 20 feet, you call her. Break, 20 feet, you call her. Break, 20 feet, you call her. And I'll just literally do that until the dog gets about 20 feet and like like almost anticipates the recall. I'm like, I'll be like, yeah, okay, good. And then the second she shoots off again, I just call her. And I just, like, hey, as many times as you want to go far away from me, I'm going to call you. So after a while, they, they stop. Nathan Reed, what brand type of muzzles do you use? For muzzle hits, I don't know. I just buy them in, in, in uh, some of these online guys. Um, again, muzzle work, it's really not about the brand of the muzzle. There's lots of people making agitation muzzles. You just want a muzzle where the dog can open his mouth. And some of them have a bite bar in there so the dog can actually feel like he's biting somebody. And some of them don't. Um, but the most important thing is that it's a, it's a stable and safe muzzle where the dog can open his mouth. And that the person who's doing the muzzle work can really sell it to the dog that they're being bitten. Hey, has awesome live, buddy, Matt D. Matt, if we know each other, thank you. And if we don't know each other, thank you. Uh, what brand? Uh, do, you, do you prefer SV or OFA? I prefer Caitlin, um, and she's referring to hip and elbow certifications. I prefer the ones that can be done soonest. I don't – OFA makes you wait two years. For me, it's ridiculous. A bitch can be bred at 18 months right? That's more than old enough. You know, so be, oh, it's too young. Why? What's six months going to make a difference? Literally, there's no medical reason that anyone can give you that a bitch should not be bred on her second heat. So for me with a breeding bitch, oh, has you're just in a big hurry to breed. No, I'm in a big hurry to see if it's worth to keep her, right? She might be a fantastic bitch, but if she's not passing it in the whelping box or if she's a really bad mother, I want to know about it. I don't want to waste time and energy training and keeping and feeding and looking after a dog that's not going to be a good mother. Better to, to, to sell her as a pet or give her away as a pet if she's not going to work out in the whelping box. And there's no reason they shouldn't be bred at 18 months. But the problem is OFA makes you wait for 24 months. SV, you can get it one year. It costs you more money, but you can get them at one year. So for me, that's that's better. And there's you can see all the same stuff at a year that you're going to see at two years. Um... Ba, 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 ba. My little guy's going off, guys. I hope you don't hear him. You can bring him straight away. No, I'm never in a hurry. Do you know any dog trainers for protection? Yes, I do. In Vancouver. So there's a good guy. He's a good guy, man. Um, I actually bring my dog to him when he comes out to Ontario. He does a helper work on Gage. You look him up. Kelly Reedman in, in B.C., Okay, he's a character. You tell him has sent you. Uh, he, I think he's called Reedman Working Dogs on Facebook. He's a character. And he, hey, you guys think I'm a straight talker? He's a straight talker. <laughs> but um, tell him has sent you. Tell him TikTok has sent you. Um, but yeah, he'll help you with your, with protection training. And he'll also tell you the truth about your dog. So don't bring him something that's not going to be, uh, that's not going to cut the mustard. Um, do you sell your females that are already bred? 
Well, anything's possible, Parm. <laughs> Throw a number at me. Um, the earliest you can start protection training. Um, for me, I don't start really protection training until eight months old. Uh, uh, Mikey Bubbles. I bought a male Mal from Craigslist. Uh, I talk to his breeder regularly, and he's been a fairly good dog. Listen, we're, you know, at the end of the day, man, like anything's possible. I like, I've sold dogs. Okay. Or I know of dogs where the person just is really not a known person. It's a decent dog. They made a breeding with a, with a good dog and the puppies were on Kijiji. It's possible for sure. It's possible. Is it likely? No. <laughs> is it hard to handle or train a Preza Canario? Well, if you don't know what you're doing, it can be. <laughs> uh, Roderick, how to determine if training your dog in protection is worth the price and possible liability? Well, that's a good question. Um, number one, liability changes depending on where you live. In some places, it's really the only type of protection that you can get away with legally. And in other places, um, depending on your lifestyle and what you've got going on, it's not worth it at all. Um, also, the dog's ability. I say to people, listen, if I can't train your dog in a few months, right? Like if it's going to, if you bring me a dog and say, hey, Haz, I want you to run a level two on my dog. And I see the dog and the quality is just not there. And it's going to be a long, long road. I say to the person, listen, um, this is like, if, if, if we can even get anywhere, it's going to take about a year. And I don't think you want to pay me what it's going to cost, right? Better to either get another dog or maybe go somewhere else. That's my out, outlook on it. Um, so I'm always looking for dogs that have the right traits that you can just, just got Mojo Joe, just got my second dog from Logan house. Mike does good work. Yes, he does. Um, the two Dutchies I had came from Logan house. Uh, one was really good. And then the other one was good, but he was also a really dominant asshole, which Mike did say, well, Mike said he was a little dominant, but when he came, he turned out to be a lot more than a little dominant. Um, but we learned a lot from that dog. Um, unfortunately he did pass away. He actually got into a dog, like he went, so funny story, not really a funny story, actually a really sad story. So this dot, this Dutch Shepherd was named Danger. Okay. We called him Danger. The second I saw him, I said, his name's Danger because he's extremely dangerous. And this dog gave one of my staff members 40 stitches. No, sorry. I should say 20 stitches. He gave him 20 stitches, bit him in the arm during protection training. Um, not, and the guy was handling the dog. I was the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> the guy was handling the dog. The dog got frustrated over being told to leave a sleeve on the ground, turned around and chewed him, chewed him up. And this, at the time, we weren't so familiar with how to deal with these types of dogs. Um, um, like Danger gave us some really invaluable lessons because Danger probably to this day is one of the most ranked dominant dogs that we've ever dealt with. He was extremely dangerous in many circumstances, both in the kennel, uh, in the crate, uh, just working around him, obedience with him, he was extremely rank dominant. Um, uh, but we, you know, over time we came to really like him because he was such a predictable asshole, so to speak. Um, and then uh, danger, unfortunately, and we were actually really getting far in the protection work with him. The problem was figuring out who to sell him to because that's that's not a dog for anybody that doesn't know what the heck they're doing. Now I could probably sell him to somebody I know, but back then I didn't know enough people to be able to sell a dog like that. And um, uh, Danger, unfortunately, uh, decided to go and growl. So at the time I had a Malinois named Bastion, okay? And Bastion was uh, my former IGP competition dog. He was in a crate in the kennel. Danger went up to him and growled at him through the crate. Turns out Bastion could break out of that crate. We didn't know because he never had. But that day he decided he was going to. He broke out of the crate and they got into a big long dog fight. And, uh, you know, I wasn't there. It was my brother Sal and somebody else. And I, Actually, no, it was just Sal by himself. So it took him a while. And he obviously was trying not to be bitten. Um, and, and anyways, they, they separated them, um, and danger was the one who came out the worst. He had a lot of bites on his legs. Bastion, of course, the asshole was just fine. Um, so, uh, we took him to the vet, of course, everything looked after him and he just kept getting swelling on his leg and we couldn't figure it out because we went to the vet several times. The vet eventually put a cast on his leg, right? And, uh, the third time, and then... We could just see Danger wasn't doing well. We took him to the vet a third time. They cut the cast and his leg had gangrene. 
the vet said, well, we're going to have to amputate the leg. I said, this is not a three-legged dog. He's not going to live a three-legged dog life. Unfortunately, uh, you know, and based on his his temperament and stuff, it's like, what, what am I going to do? Have danger as a three-legged dog? I'm going to be able to nurse him to health while he's trying to eat everybody. <laughs> so sadly, um, even and, you know, we gave him and he went to the vet like a couple times. It's still to this day, you know, the only dog that's really um, only one of my dogs that's really like just died like that. Like, I don't know what it was. Anyway, well, no, we do know what it was. So he turns out his thumb was broken and like it was a compound fracture but somehow the vet missed it and it got infected despite the antibiotics that he was getting and um so anyways yeah gangrene and we put him down and as we were putting him down i said you know i was being nice to him petting him hey buddy is good blah 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 and that gives him the needle and that dog looked into my eyes and he went <sighs> and i said man consistent right to the end he was a good dog, man. It was, I really, really regret how it turned out with him. Um, you know, he probably would have still been here to this day, though, had he not uh, gotten on the wrong end of Bastion. Um, but, man, unfortunate. Anyways, I did get another um, Dutchie with Danger um, from Mike. And really nice dog. We, we trained him and sold him as a protection dog. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Any seminars planned anytime soon? No, not right now. Um, I'm really working on these puppy courses and my sport course and also my um, reactive dog course. So it's, it's hard shooting these courses. So that, that's my primary goal right now. If someone books us for a seminar, it's possible. Right now, nothing uh, right now. Do you use any supplements? Yeah, I use Vertex. I like Vertex. What do you mean when you say dog's handler sensitive? I mean the dog is sensitive towards the handler. <laughs> right like overly concerned so the handler you know beyond what's normal so if the handler says hey and the dog's like <laughs> right or you know the handler gives the dog a tiny correction and the dog is really sensitive overreacts to that stimuli from the handler we say that these dogs are handler sensitive it can be good and bad depending on the dog a lot of malinois are handler sensitive but they deal with that handler sensitivity by actually being more reactive towards the handler which is why people get bit a lot by their malinois and by their dutch shepherds Watch my um, watch my video on why police canines bite their handlers, and you might get some more insight into that. I already said presses are a good guard dog. Do you allow protection dogs to interact with other people other than your family? It depends on the dog. It depends how social he is. It depends on what his job is. It depends on who the people are. I sell a lot of protection dogs that end up interacting with a lot of people because the people that own them live very um, social lives. Ba -ba 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 -ba. There's no dog that has a straight back, by the way. If your dog had a straight back, I'm referring to Ara. We have a seven-month-old GSD with a straight back. He, is, he has heavier bone structure when compared with general weight and height of any other. Is he a DDR? If you don't know, he's probably not. Well, no, I guarantee you he's not. Um, the weight and the straightness of your dog's back. This is the thing. Oh, straight back German Shepherds. What you mean is your dog is not hyperangulated like a lot of the dogs that have the, the big curvature, the roach backs. Um, that you see in the in the in the show lines but listen you also have dogs that that have a curvature in the spine and the working side of things as well um the straightness of your dog's back does not imply quality or even um health unfortunately you know i've seen plenty of dogs that have you know a, a straighter it's never completely straight because there's no spine that's completely straight there's always a curvature right um that uh, will have back problems. So there's no, the straightness of your dog's back does not imply the health of the dog. Uh, my dog is e-collar and prong collar smart. Yeah. Um, how do I get my pup to come to me at six weeks? He seems to want to be on his own. Put a leash on him and give him food. He'll come. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Graduate of your level one group class. Have let my dog's training regress, but he's still pretty good. Do you think I need to repeat the level one class? Well, there's no catching up in level two launch. And um, I'm saying launch because that's your name on the YouTube. Uh, level two is a continuation of level one. So maybe take a private session and get caught up. I feed raw and kibble. Roderick, not both. Um, my working GSD can't stop barking when I have guests. Oh, he can. You just haven't incentivized him to stop barking. Um you must correct him, burden, and you must correct him in a way that he says, okay, I'm not going to bark anymore. 
As far as line leaning, is there a best way to do it? No, there isn't. If you have to ask, you shouldn't do it. <laughs> it's not something to mess around with. Uh, you need to really know what you're doing. I will say this, generally brother and sister, bad idea. You don't want to do that. What do you think about big companies that supply police dogs to departments? Yeah. I mean, what do I think about them? So with police departments, what you have to understand is this. So the, su the supplying of the police departments with the, the whole law enforcement community and stuff like this, a lot of the times these police departments have contracts with these big suppliers or they have relationships with these suppliers. And they're the kind of dogs, like, for instance, if I was, I as someone that that department didn't know offered them that dog, they would not buy it. But because the guy that they know is offering them that dog, they will buy it. I find that the really big ones tend to have a lot of maybe lower quality dogs. And then the, the, maybe the, the, the smaller ones that, you know, actually I shouldn't say that because there's plenty of small ones that do have pretty low quality dogs too. But I mean, what do I say? Pedigree, of course, doesn't matter when you're selling dogs. It's what's the dog in front of you say, right? Um, 10 to 15K, I'd want one coming from a good lineage. Well, Richie, you're not buying a police dog. They're catering to a police department, so they don't really care. Um, thoughts on primitive and feral breeds? They're primitive and feral. Um, what type of dog is best for a first-time pet owner? Get a lab. I like labs. If you're going to get a working dog, get a German Shepherd. They're very, they tend to be more forgiving. Hey, quiet. Quiet. This is what I'm talking about, right? He thinks he hears something and he's going to bark. And I tell him, be quiet. And he must be quiet. And if he doesn't be quiet, like if he barks again now, I've told him to be quiet. If he barks again, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go correct him, right? That's what I mean by by backing up what you say right and the other one barking is the chihuahua i'm not gonna bother to chase her down she does what she wants you be quiet s'mores there you go that's good training um ba -ba 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 -ba. what are your thoughts on owning and managing a protection trained working line german shepherd in the city i sell to city people all the time it's fine if the dog's properly trained and properly selected in your opinion, are European lines of German Shepherds and other European line dog breeds more ideal for protection work in contrast to the American line counterparts? It's not about the locality of the line. It's about the, the purpose for which the line was was bred. You know, like what, what were they bred for? Like I told you, the, the best dogs that, you know, I've bought and used so far in breeding had come from local breeders. Now, they're using a lot of dogs from Europe, but it's not the locality. It's what were they bred to do? There's show lines in Europe. There's show lines in America. There's pet lines in Europe. There's pet lines in America. There's working lines in Europe. There's working lines in America. What were they bred to do? It's not about where they come from. Um, would love for my beautiful one-year-old Mal to have a litter one day just to make her a mama. Do you think this would mellow her out? Don't breed your Mal, Wa. Why would, why would her being a mother help her in any way? You think she has some yearning to be maternal? Like, this is the kind of nonsense, you know, that people joke about online, like how people breed. Do not breed your dog. Fix your dog. If you're going to, you know, just based on that, you know, I, I might be coming across as harsh, but this is where the crappy Malinois come from. Sorry, Megan. I know I come across a little intense, but, you know, that kind of stuff. Do not breed your dog just so that she can be a mother. It's, it's, it's It will not mellow her out. You know what will mellow her out? Good training. That's what will help her. Go find a good trainer. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Don't ask me about purchases, Nathan, on here. We cannot, we're not going to talk about wire transfers on a live. <laughs> will you do another GSD Malcross? Yes, I probably will. That's a, that's a line that I'm going to continue to work with. I kept a female back from my last herder breeding. I really like that breeding. A lot of consistency in that litter. Um, do you know any trainers that do protection in California? I can't say I do. Uh, elite member for loose leash walking. Are we correcting our dogs for hanging out at the end of the leash or only for pulling? Mine tends to mostly hang out towards the end of the leash but doesn't pull. For the dogs that like to hang on the end of the leash, I set them up to pull, right? 
they just there, but they're not quite there. I know what you're talking about. Usually people also are doing this with their hand. I bring my hand down to my side and then I walk. I'll walk really fast and then I'll hit the brakes. And usually the ones that hang on the end of the leash, they can't help but hit the end of the leash. Bang, big correction. I do that a few times. Believe me, he gets back off the end of that leash. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Do I know any good trainers in NYC? No, no, I don't, unfortunately. Um, I'm sure there are some, but I, I just can't recommend any. Um, I don't know what combination he was from. I bought him as a young adult. They're talking about danger. If you're training your dog in the yard and she sees the neighbor's cat, Mary, I think you need to take my elite course. <laughs> um, da, 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 da. Do you have an online course that can help me with a Rottweiler? Guys, your the breed of your dog doesn't change how like you you uh, doesn't change how you train it. Like you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, is this gonna work on a pit bull? Dogs are dogs. They learn the same way. Now, of course, individuals within specific breeds, you know, the application of pressure and release might be slightly different. But the fundamental philosophy behind the training is the same. You make it good to be good and you make it bad to be bad and you communicate clearly with the dog. There's no special breed that only needs a special kind of training. Uh, I don't talk about other trainers on here. You want to ask me about another trainer, Shana? I cannot answer that. Uh, ba, 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 train my dog watching your videos. Awesome, Chris. I'm happy to hear that. Is hyperactivity um, really the result of bad breeding or handler error? Both. Uh, no. Malawas? Malawas are hyper dogs. That's Listen, you just got to know how to handle those dogs. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Okay, guys, I'm just looking for elite members here because I'm looking to wrap this up. There are no books on proper breeding ethics, Roderick, that I would recommend. There's books on how to whelp puppies, but if you're going to breed a working dog, get involved in that working community, and then you'll have a better idea how to do it. What can I do to help my husky stop pulling on the leash? I've tried a halty. I've tried various harnesses. I've tried pulling him back roughly, nipping his neck, prong treats, and a water bottle. Well, good news. I have a free video out called loose leash walking it's the only loose leash, loose leash walking video on the internet that will actually substantively fix your problem watch that video do what i do in that video and your dog will walk really nicely on a loose leash um do i use an e-collar to add more aggressivity um in the drive Oh, oh, you mean protection training? Yeah, I do use e-collars and protection training, but that's not something that you should ever even think about using unless you really know what the hell you're doing because you will break a dog real quick doing that. Okay, guys, thank you for watching. This was an impromptu live stream. Um, I was just like, you know what? I have a space this evening and I haven't talked to people for a while because like I said, you know, my son's come and I uh, haven't been sleeping a lot at night so we, and been really busy shooting videos during the day and other stuff. So anyways... Um, thank you for watching and the next live stream, there'll be more, more preparation in terms of, um, I'll notify you guys more ahead of time that that one's coming and, and you'll be more, have more notice that it's, that it's going to be up. Thanks for watching guys. Um, uh, what I would like to say is if you have, um, any, uh, videos, so for those of you in my elite program, if you have any videos um, of your training and you, you have a question about it, send me the video. I don't guarantee, I don't guarantee I will answer it. Send me your video in an unlisted YouTube link. I don't guarantee I'll answer your question, but it'll give me some, some stuff for the live to talk about. Um, so the next live, if you're in my elite training course, send me a video. Thank you for watching and you all have a good night.